um, for a moment of time. So we're looking forward to that presentation. Thank you very much for coming, and the floor is yours. Thank you for that, uh, this really, really kind introduction. And it's a great honor for me to be here today and give my view of, of research, but also how to work really close to patients. And we have seen how important rehabilitation is. And it was a wonderful moment for me to listen to Jakob and, and uh, see what he could present for us uh, and was really, really nice. So I will give an overview of this research field with the image science and also a little about the future, how we can use the new tools to, to, to make the patient comes in, they can be diagnosed properly and treated and we have seen the results that we can do today, but hopefully we can be, do even more tomorrow. Let's see if it, no. Is it possible to get, a, otherwise I can see if I can use it like this way. That's okay. So, CMIV, Center for Medical Image Science and Visualization. Uh, why do we need this type of centers? Well, you know, population pyramids, we were going to be older and there are fewer of us will be working in the healthcare compared to how many there will be there's elderly. Uh, we have also uh, another type of society. You know, we have the older people with also different cultures coming in to Sweden, but it also means that we have other demands on the healthcare uh, that we need to consider. We have a problem today regarding research, I think. Uh, it's quite easy to have a good idea to do research and from the technical faculty side, well, it's easy to publish. You get money, funding, you publish, you defend your thesis and you put your result in yourself. Shelf. And you will not reach the whole way. It's really tricky to, to use it as an innovation that you can use something. You take the research, the results, and move it over into the healthcare so it, it will be good for the patients. That's, that's really tricky. Normally we have these silos between the technical faculty, the medical faculty, the county council and the patient. Also we try to look at sub-components. So we need to have research that goes the whole way so we can change the system, new ways to treat, to diagnose, etc. And we need to do it quite radical, not incremental in small steps. That's too expensive and it takes too long time. Of course, we need to validate. We need to see that we really have good tools that you can use. Um, and translational research is also extremely important that we can use that type of. So we have the medical demands will stay at the technical research. Regarding patient from the patient perspective. I think it's, it's important that we have that type of perspectives in our head, also as a researcher. I'm mainly a researcher. Uh, I'm, I'm always talking about in betweenness. I'm between the technical faculty, the medical faculty. I'm a radiologist for training, but I, I work mainly with research today. Uh, and I'm between the patient and the university and the county council. So, so it's important that we can work together translation. And the patient will, it could be quite practical things that the patient, questions that arise when you're sitting in the wheelchair. Uh, well, could we diagnose, could we map the scars, uh, could we see um, well, vessels that has been hurt, so to say we have a lack of oxygen in, in, in the spine cord. Uh, could we fix this? Could we fix malformations in an easy way uh, that we don't need to operate, maybe? So, so there are a lot of questions. We need to have this in our head also, this type of same questions. And again, technical faculty, medical faculty, healthcare industry normally works as an inner silo. And we have this ground research, the green one, the idea research, etc. And will you get some publications out, etc. And in this field, yeah, this is the clinical part. Uh, it's not so easy to get this link. This, and well, yes, okay, of course, we have, we have 
benefits from the research in the healthcare. We have, but I think we can do much more. Uh, if we can connect this between, so we let the medical demonstrate the technical research, and it goes around and around, and also to the industry. Well, we can increase the number of publications, high-impact publications, but also it's really, really good for the patient and for the industry, who has been off companies, etc. So, so that's important. So I think this interdisciplinary research is ex ex extremely important, and that's why we need universities. And in Lernshaping, we are really used to work cross over, so to say. And that's also why we started CMIV. That's the background for CMIV. And here we have three legs. We have the university. We belong to the university. But we have a research agreement with county council, and we have a research agreement with private companies in the same setting. But the most important player, actually, that's the patients. Extremely important. So all the research should be good for the patients. We always look for that. We have quite many projects ongoing, more than 120, 150 projects maybe, and there should be some part of the project should end up in good, it is good for the patients. And we have a quite many spin-off companies that moved out now from CMIV, and, and it is going really, really well for them, because it's not so useful, it's not common that you have this type of research over the borders. We are located in the center of the university hospital, absolutely in the center, and that's also important. We should be there, even if we have really heavy equipment, expensive equipment, and this, it's located here. This is CMIV, this is the radiology department, and this is the rest of the hospital. So we do clinical scans uh, for all the radiology department, and we have other types of, of, of equipment, because we have research agreement with the companies. So we have three MRI scanners, that's ours, and absolute latest type of scanners, uh, and we work direct with the, with the companies, with the factory for Siemens and Philips for MRI, etc. and we have two uh, CT scanners, absolutely high-end scanners, and this scanner, the fourth scanner, was one of the first in the world that was installed. Uh, so, and we have a public venue, so to say, we have a virtual reality theater where these modalities are connected directly with a virtual wall. You can bring up the body hanging in there, five meter big, and I use that for medical students, for anatomy lessons, for thorax, neck and the head. And then we take real patients, so to say, live, from the scanners, bring them up, and we can go into the body, and we can show the students that it doesn't look as in the book. In the book, everyone looks the same, always. But in the, in the real world, it's not that, in that way. So we have also a locked facility in the middle with air locks here, an experimental room. We can have animals. We have an elevator coming up here from the basement, and also post-mortem scans, uh, post-mortem uh, bodies that comes from the forensic department that we scan in the morning. And the patient comes through the radiology department in this way into the setting. Uh, we started to build the next building. This is quite new. We have been here a little more than a year. Uh, and it's five times bigger than the last department. That we, and now they are building this uh, in two floors for us, only for researchers. So there will be about 80 more researchers moving in in, in one and a half year from now. But more important is people at CMIV, how we work together from the medical, technical field and students in the same settings. So this is much, much important, more important. Uh, Anne Marie Lantlom is a, neuro a professor in neuro neurology. Uh, Marcel Vantias is a clinical scientist, a researcher, he has been head of the hardware research at Philips in Holland uh, for MRI before, and Frida has been a PhD student. Uh, one of my PhD students working with 3D visualization and, and flow simulation, etc. And now, then she moved over to working with Jos Griping, the Aerofighter research here at Linköping. The same software, the same type of, of tools. And now we are bringing tools back from them. We have ways to simulate flow that we use for the, for the heart in vessels, etc. So there is a cross border in both directions. So, oh, sorry. See if I can go back. Nope. Let's keep that. Uh, well, the staff is important. 
It, the staff is handpicked, people that love to work cross-border. Now it's about 110 researchers at CCMI. We have 40 PC students, 50% from technical faculty, 50% from the medical faculty. Uh, and it doesn't matter what stands on your badge. It's who you are and how you can work together. That's more important for us. And we have projects in both medical and the technical field. Uh, but it should be good for the patient. And it could be anywhere in this pipeline to acquire data, to use math, to calculate, to visualize, and to move it out in the healthcare. And the plus sign is extremely important. And that's the coffer room. So the coffer room is in the center of the department. Everyone meets, by clinicians coming in, students, physicists, uh, etc. So the coffer room here is where all projects almost start. And we have real clinical questions from a clinician, from a surgeon, etc. comes in, we discuss, and then we try to apply for a grant because we need money. And we don't have almost really, really small amount of money from the university and the county council. The rest is the normal way from the, the Science Foundation, EU, Vinova, that's also state money, etc. But we need to apply for that. And we have our own board. We don't belong to an, an institution or faculty. We are just under the head of the university. So we have our own networks in the world. We have our own servers, our own economy. So everyone, everything is ours. But everyone believes that they own CMIV. So if you ask the heart center, it says, oh, CMIV is ours, they need to have more space. And if you ask the radiology department, it says, oh, CMIV is important for us, we need more equipment. And because everyone thinks that, well, then the new department is five times bigger than the, the old department. But everyone else has the same space area, so to say, in, in the hospital when they moved over to the new building. So that's, that's really good for us. But it's also good for the patient. So the board is also from the, the county council, from the university and the industry. And we have a, our own scientific council, we have our own faculty. And the research areas, well, we started with the brain and the heart, but now we're moving over to other areas also. And, and orthopedic is, is one of them. Uh, and also we're working with a new field that's called digit pathology. And we have actually the largest database in the world just now with digit pathology images. More than, more than one million uh, scans has been done. And all, now the hospital is almost completely digital regarding pathology as one of the first in the world. So we're trying to integrate that into the radiology. So it's the same system that we store the data in also. So that's integrated diagnostics. And looking for the orthopedic part and, and the projects you now coming up, uh, well, you know the aging population, well, it means that we need to have more orthopedic, but osteoporosis, etc. And also we have less resources because of the aging people um, population. And also the requirement that you should have full mobility. And that puts also demands on, on the treatment to get there. And we need really, really good tools to diagnose so we can treat in the right way. Uh, and looking for, for, in Sweden, care injuries, well, of them, 15% comes from surgery. And it's really expensive. And 25% of the insurance costs, well, they are related to orthopedic injuries. Uh, and for the society, it's even much, much more, of course. So we need to have really good tools. We have started up a new orthopedic uh, multi-center study in Sweden, a national study that's called PRECIS. It's precision instruments in the orthopedic, sur for in orthopedic surgery. And it's Venova, it's state money, uh, and it's behind this. And we try to work in this way. And they are, Sektra is one of, of the companies here from Linköping. It's a PAX company where you store the radiology images, also did it paternity. And, and they have the research facility at CMIV. Uh, and the headquarters here at the, the campus, technical campus, and, and the science, science park. And they are one of the biggest in the world now. And it was also a spin off company from the university. They have around 800 employees now, just now. Uh, but we try to work together in this way. And we also will try to go, go the whole way from basic research over to products, products that can be used in the healthcare. 
Uh, we have our own research school uh, at the department, 50% from both technical and medical faculty. And the tools we have that we work with, well, one of them is, is uh, computer tomography. I, I've been working with CT for many, many, many years, and I think this is a fantastic tool. Uh, and from 72, when it was invented, so to say, of Hounsfield, uh, the speed has been amazing. It's, it's uh, almost the speed of light change in speed uh, from the start until now. We can span, span, scan the whole body now with the fastest scanner that we have. It's about two seconds. We can scan the thorax, it's 130 milliseconds. You don't need to sedate patients, children, etc. Don't, you don't need to hold your breath. Uh, extremely fast, and you can also do 4D images. You can see the hand moving, etc. So this is uh, one of the first whole body scanners from 74, and the commercial for that. And 85, this was the first side of the first brochure for, from Siemens, the, how they market this machine. Well, you can't sell computer tomography scanners today, but you can still sell boats and carts, etc. in this way. Uh, this was one of the first dual energy, dual source scanners with two X-ray tubes and two detectors in the world that gives you much more information out from the scanner. And this we scanned a full-size bear from Colmode in the local zoo. And we have scanned a huge amount of animals for research, for us mainly. We can send this data to other university. They don't need to consider the ethical part. Uh, and it's dead animals, normally. Not always. Uh, inside the in modern type of OCT scanner, everything rotates. And the fastest is about four, four rotations per second. Uh, the patient can't see this, uh, but it's extremely fast. And the radiation dose has went down about 70 times since we started to scan O3. And we can do nice images, but it should be good for the patient also. That's extremely important. And we have new ways to visualize. This is, comes from also CMIV a new way to use shading, so it looks more like the, the natural uh, images, so to say. And we use it for education mainly today. And we developed a table, a virtual autopsy table, what's the name from the beginning, but now it's, it's not a virtual autopsy, it's a visualization table that we can use. And we can use that for planning, of course, but mainly now it's for training. Uh, so this is the same data, it's scanned, it's about 100 milliseconds, uh, and you can get change the settings afterwards, and this is the same data. And 4D, this is a heart scan, uh, so we can visualize the heart and how it moves, we can look for the valvulets, uh, but we can also look for other things. This was one of the first scans that we made regarding uh, tendons, uh, and it's actually filmed with my iPhone directly on, on the scanner. But it was used then of the surgeons, because here was the problem, and they used this when they, they operate, actually. Uh, you can't get this information in, in the normal way. And this is a knee, and now we have a really, really big study, ongoing national study regarding knees. Uh, look for soft tissue in the easy way. Um, regarding heart, well, we have scanned a lot of coroners, and we have the world's longest follow-up time now for CT of the, of the coroners. It takes about maybe 80 milliseconds to scan. You don't hold, you hold your breath, you scan, and then you go home. Uh, in IV injection, really easy. And you can see the coroners, and you can also simulate the flow in the coroners to see if it's a significant stenosis that you need to treat. And we have also, when we follow up, seen that about 40 to 60 percent of all patients, they do unnecessary normal cath, where they put catheter in the whole way, uh, and you can't go and use your leg the same day anymore, and you need to stay at the hospital for a day. So this is much cheaper, and it saves a lot. Also lower risk, of course, and lower radiation dose. Uh, it has been a problem to visualize the flow in the heart, to have functional imaging, and also in small vessels around the spinal cord, for instance. But now we've just developed a new tool. So you can take data that we have already scanned. You scan, you send the patient home, you can see the coroners, but now we can also take that data and simulate the flow from the information we have so we will see a quantitative assessment of the blood flow. 
And because this is simulated, we can also do what if scenarios. If I do this, if I change the value, what happens then with the flow? And when we know the flow, we can calculate the pressure from this also. So it gives huge amount of information out. And this is the first image scan in the world, and it's now about eight months ago. And we have made also the first clinical validation study when we have really measured the flow in the MRI scanner and compared, and it's the same result. So it's, it's really, really promising. And this is also from one of the first patients that we scanned. Uh, Suddenly you can see the flow inside the heart. So you can do what-if scenarios, and then you can do it in other organs. You can look around the spinal cord, of course, you can look for vessels, etc. And you can also see edema uh, in the tissue. Uh, to do that, we use two X-ray tubes and, and or the different ways to acquire two data sets with different energies. So you have one spectra and another, and this is the energies, and this is the attenuation, uh, and the, the energy also of, of the amount of, of uh, gradation, so to say. Uh, but when we have this, I will not go into how it's done, but it means that normally a tissue, an element, they have their own curve, attenuation curve. So this is the energy and this is the attenuation. How much radiation that be absorbed in the tissue, so to say. It's different between different energies. So all the tissues, they have their own curve. It's typical for, for this. And this is iodine and the blow is bone. Uh, water has this curve. And if you have two points, you can figure out which curve it is. And then you can tell what type of tissue you're looking at. Uh, and it's quantitative, so you can measure amount of tissue. You can measure amount of, of calcium in milliliter, milligram per milliliter tissue. So you have absolute value. It's a quantitative image. That's really, really good. You can use that. So if you take a forensic child, you scan, you take a slice through the heart, but the black is gas, that's normal, postmortem gas. But the gray, well, it's hard to tell. Is it blunt? Is it fluid? Uh, well, you don't know. It should be air, but it isn't in this case. So I don't really know. If I put the measurement, the Hauser value, it will be the same. Yeah, then you measure the gray scale. It doesn't tell you what it is. But if you do this with dual energy and you scan and you look at the images, well, this is the same. Same child, the same slice with dual energy. And the red is iodine and it's blood. And you can measure amount of blood it is and it's blood in the muscles also and blood here. So it gives you much, much more information. You can see you're bleeding, for instance. Uh, and I know it's blood because this is from one of the postmortem scans. So we have the autopsy and then we compare and then we know. Then we can use this setting, the protocol on the living. So we can jump in, uh, in the research, so to say. We have the real gold standard. So that's how we do the postmortem scans. Uh, so it's extremely important for us to use that. Well, let's plan all of it. And you can get more information so you can do nicer uh, 3D images also. This is without any contrast. You can see most really small, narrow vessels, and you can see the tendons. And now we can do 4D also, so you can see that everything is moving. Uh, and because it's quantitative, you can measure the amount of iodine, and this is iodine. And you can also remove the iodine, so you can have images without iodine, even if you have scanned only once. So you can save one scan, reduce the radiation dose. And this is the heart. This is a normal CT angiography heart. You can see calcium, an arid vessel, but it doesn't tell you anything regarding the myocardium, the functionality. Uh, is this a significant stenosis? Well, this is from the same data, and it's a slice here with dual energy, and then you can see here, there is no blood in this part. So yes, you need to do something. So it gives you more information. You can also use the different entities to get rid of streaking artifacts from metal. And that's really a problem in, in the spine when you have a lot of metal. If you operate the patient uh, or you have a scoliosis, for instance, well, you can't do MRI because of the metal. 
Uh, but here, you, this is the heart pump. Uh, it's a hip prosthesis, and you can then change after you have scanned, you can choose the energy virtually and you can get rid of a lot of, of artifacts. In this case, all of the artifacts are gone. Uh, this was a, a teenager that you see operated uh, for scoliosis. No, it's what uh, only to put this, all the metal in, and you can't do MR, it's impossible. Then it would be only black holes here everywhere. But this patient, a teenager, have a lot of pain. Uh, and so we made a dual energy CT myrography, injected contrast around the spinal cord, and here you see one of the screws goes in to the, let's see if we can zoom up here. So they took away the screw and the pain was gone. Uh, so this was actually the only way to see this. So it really helped. So after we have scanned, you can choose the level of energies. You can simulate and you can get images without these nasty artifacts. Here also this is MRI, you see the black holes from the metal in the images. Another way to use dual energy, you can see bone edema directly. So if you have a trauma, you can't see your fracture, you can see the bone edema, as you can do with MRI. But here you have it for free at the same time when you scan the whole body for two seconds, in the trauma unit, for instance. Uh, and you can also see in the vertebras, if it's an old or new fracture. If it's a new, you have a bone edema that you can see. So the green color is the bone edema here, and it's a fracture. It, well, you can see it there, but sometimes you don't see the fracture line at all, and you can see the edema quite well. Here again, there is a fracture there. Uh, and now we started the study to look for knees. Uh, and sometimes you can have bone edema and you have fractures that you can't really see on, on, on a conventional way. Uh, and there are some work done regarding the spine also, and, and, but not the spinal cord, as I know. It's completely new. Uh, regarding vertebrae, there has been a couple of publications out. Uh, in Vancouver, they, they use it a lot at the University of British Columbia, and we have a research agreement. We work together with visualization, and we just got a quite big grant together. Uh, we have a, a big study ongoing now looking for soft tissue and, and bone edema in my knees. So we scanned 500. It just started. Uh, for CT, what's going in the coming in the future? I will really short talk about that. Normally we have a detector. You have an x-ray tube, you scan through the patient, so to say, with the radiation goes through, and you measure amount of radiation that comes to the detector. And normally you get light out, and then you measure the amount of light. And that's the thing you, know, you, mean, you measure. So you have measure all spectra, so you don't really know what you're measuring. Um, but in the future, and in, actually in the near future, we'll have another type of detector that's coming. And there are a couple of them in the world now. And we have, a, I work together with Mayo Clinics in Rochester in the US. They have a scanner now up and running. Uh, and with that scanner, you can measure directly the amount of radiation that comes into the detector. Uh, and you can measure single energies. So you can have many, many energy levels. That means that you can separate tissue much better. You can look for certain types of tissues. You can have man, many contrast agents at the same time and see different things. Uh, and the really good thing is the resolution will be in enormous. You, really, really, really high-res images. Even better than conventional X-ray when we have a film. So, and radiation dose is lower. And you can get rid of all the noise in the image also because you put the treasure hold and you measure each photon that comes into the detector. So this is the future. And hopefully we will have a scanner in one to two years at CMIV. And for MRI, well, also tremendous research ongoing. Normally an MRI image is not quantitative. You can't measure in an MRI image. It's impossible. The grayscale would change the whole time, depending on the temperature in the room, the temp temperature in the patient, and 2,500 other things. So you don't re really know. You need to look at many different types of settings. You change the buttons, and you scan, and you change again, and it takes 15 minutes or, one, or 90 minutes to scan an organ. 
uh, and then you have a huge amount of images and you look at these. But you can't measure in a normal MRI. But there has been a new way to do this at, in the CMIME that's called synthetic MR. And then we have a synthetic Hounsfield value. That means that you can really trust the images independent of, of the scanner and the manufacturer. It will always be the same. You can scan once for the brain and then you can change the setting afterwards. I have all the other sequences from the, the scan. So it's really good for the patient also. And this is children that has been scanned one month of age, four years of age. The green color is myelin, uh, so it's fat, so to say. And you can measure the amount of, of myelin fat tissue, uh, quantitative, and then you can follow development. And these conventional MRI images, you can't really see nothing. So, so this is coming, and it would be really, really good, I think, for the spinal cord and, and the surroundings for, to really quantify. And you can measure and see what type of tissue it is. This is in the brain, and you can see white matter, gray matter, and CSF. This is outside all the plots in this area, and this is multiple sclerosis. Uh, and then you can measure the size of the plant, uh, and you can see if treatment works. And you can really follow it because it's, it's absolute values. The volume is absolute. If you compare with another scanner, you will have, you will have the same volume. And it, now it's validated and it's published a lot. So, so it's really working fine. Uh, and for start, when we start to use this and start to publish, no one of the big vendors believed on this. And so now you can't do this. We will not pay this type of research for you. And there was a spin-off company started at CMIV of some of the researchers, and now it's really taking off. And all scanners in the world has licensed this now, the technology. Uh, and, and the company, it's, it's sitting here in, in the center of the city now, uh, and it, it's growing. Uh, and, and the stock market, this, you know, it goes like this for them. That's really good. Another company that's called Ambra Advanced MR Analytics, they invented a way also to quantitative measure the amount of, of uh, water and the muscle mass in volume, absolute values, and you can follow the patient. And it's also in, in three years, they've gone from three researchers to 40 employees, and they have research agreements with all the big universities in the world now, and it's, it's a really, really good tool. And you can also look for... for water molecules, how they move in, in uh, and fiber tracking, and diffusion imaging, etc. So I think that's really promising for, for spinal cord injuries in the future. And flow quantification, you can also do this with MRI, and this is the theater, we use it for education, but also in clinical setting, so we can have the heart hanging in there, and you can see the flow coming uh, in real time. This is quite old image, but still you can see, we don't use any IV contrast, you only scan the patient in the scanner and patient goes home and then you can have this type of information out. And for education it's, it's really, really good. This is the same images, I'll go through this. And fat, you can quantify the amount of fat, both for dual NECG and synthetic MR. Uh, and we have been looking for fat, brown fat, white fat, uh, the fat around the spine, uh, we are now looking for the coroners, around the coroners, and we, this is a child with eye bat, brown fat back here, uh, and this is also a mouse that we scanned, and we could prove that children had brown fat, uh, and also there is fat in this region around the kidneys is brown fat. And we find a new type of fat, it's white, br uh, bright fat, it's between white and brown fat, and brown fat comes from the muscle uh, steam cell and vessel wall. Uh, it's not fat, actually. And the white fat, that comes from the fat. But bright fat works like brown fat, produce heat from sugar. Uh, and it comes from white fat. And we, we discovered this uh, uh, because we could do, use the post-mortem scans and we can get, well, the real gold standard. So we could we published this in Nature uh, 2013. So we were the first to, to, to see this bright fat. And it's really promising uh, research now because if we can find the key to, to activate the bright fat, there is a really, really good way to reduce your weight uh, in, in a way that you don't have any drawbacks from it. It will be the patient's own way to do it, so to say. And this is uh, 
MRI, and it was brown fat, and this, the green color here is also brown fat, and this is also brown fat in this region. And in the same way we do with artifacts from metal, we can choose the annual level, and we can see this is the bright fat, have another curve, attenuation curve, depending on, on the energy, and that's because there are more water in, in the brown fat and there's more iron in the, in the brown fat. So in the future, well, we will divide imaging in, into parts, so to say. One is personalized imaging. We work to, as we do today. We look at one patient and we try to figure out what's wrong. Uh, and in the future, we'll move over to the precision imaging. That means that we use the information from other patients also. Uh, and we'll tra train the computer to help us to make the right diagnosis. So today, I look at the images. I'm, and the result will be a quite unstructured report, a lot of words. Uh, but tomorrow we will need structured reporting. That's really, really important. And we will work with precision imaging. And then we look for the whole population. We take a lot, huge amount of data from other exams. Uh, and we divide it in subpopulations. And we try to quantify, as we can do with dual energy or spectral CT and synthetic MR, so we have quantitative data out, and then we can compare different patients, different results, different genomes, and add everything into one computer that can do use, that's called deep learning. It's the same as you have the car that can drive by themselves now. It's, you don't really know how they do it, but the results is quite good. So it's important that you validate, but it seems to work. So, if we add, we take the data, it's quantified, we compare with other patients, and then we add the genome, maybe we can try to predict and also see what type of treatment we should use, give to this patient. Uh, and uh, it's coming, actually. So we just got a quite big grant this week, uh, now from Vinova. Uh, and CMI will be a center, a national center for this type of research. So all patients that comes to CMI, we will include uh, the database, all the data from them. We have informed consent from everyone, uh, and we will have a really, really big database with quantitative, high-quality images. And then people from the rest of the country and from outside can come to us and do their, their research. We have a fellowship program. So this is absolutely new, uh, and we really believe this will be crucial uh, for, for the future. So we will, radiomics, we will extract radio, uh, radiomic parameters. That's new things in the images. That you, 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 as a radiologist, you can see it, but you don't take care. You don't really see it, maybe, or you believe now this is normal. And, but if you compare this with other images uh, and the outcome from this, and you train the computer, the computer can help you. Uh, and I think it will be really, really good so that we can make the right diagnosis and also predict uh, in a better way. So we have the images coming in and we look for the form, the texture, uh, the fastness, etc., the location, and then we compare with other patients with the same. And also we add information from the from uh, the his uh, health information system, uh, and we add genome, etc., and then we do this. We let the computer calculate. And postmortem, I will end up with postmortem. We use this for research, and, and here we can use really high amount of radiation, as high as we can. Uh, and we can get really nice images. And we can afterwards see, if we can change the settings so we can look for gas. This is the same exam. We can look for gas, we can look for soft tissue, etc. Gas is really hard to see when you do the postmortem exam. But for us to test new things, to test new types of um, image acquisition, and have the real gold standard. It's extremely good for research. At the same time, we help our colleagues at the forensic department. And now we have scanned a lot of dead bodies last year and acquired normal values from all the parts of the brain, for instance. It's absolute values that we can feed into the computer. Uh, and if we map 
Again, this is a white matter, nucleus caudatus, putamen, etc. We will have the normal values, absolute values for MRI, and then we can have a normal uh, map, so to say, for the whole body that you can compare with when we do say, clinical scans. And we also use animal, dead, dead, and dead animals, try to visualize small vessels. Uh, it's post mortem injection and contrast, it works really, really good. And this is a horse, you can see the small vessels here in, in the ears, nose, uh, and adax antelope, and you can see the horns. Uh, so we, we have ways to test and try to do high res images, and then we can move this skill over to the living. Uh, so giraffe, we scanned, it scanned partially only the neck, it's two meters of it, uh, and it was dead from call more than the local, so you see the tongue, the nose, the ears, and really, really tiny vessels, and it works really good. Uh, and this is a, a factory for eggs, you can see the vessels here, it's almost ready for delivery. Uh, and also test new types of contrast agents. This is a, a dead body that we injected different types of uh, contrast. So the veins are blue and the arteries are red. And then you can move this over to the visualization table and the students can use this when they do the uh, dissection. And then we have the real body there and then you have the virtual body here and you can compare and you can rotate and go into this virtual body. And then you can see the vessels. Uh, so integrated diagnostics, when you combine everything into one, it's, it's coming. And you can take data from the histology and move it over to radiology, uh, and you can compare. And also, other, other tests that you do, you can put into the same computer, so to say. Uh, we have a big... The, the pathology project is national projects in almost the whole country. 85% of the country has been in, in the project, and we've been working together, translational. Uh, and also, we're trying to use this with new types of MRI, uh, with multinuclear spectroscopy from the MR. We have uh, new types of contrast agents, also with nanoparticles that we work. Uh, so we can use this both for MRI and CT. Re cheap, easy and it will give you much more information, not only for diagnostic, but it's also for treatment. You can put chemo on this, and you can, that goes to a certain type of tumor, etc. This is research, and it will take a couple of many, many years before it, we can use it on patients, but the promising results so far. Uh, and now I will end up with case. Also, this is a well, middle-aged woman that was hit by a train, uh, and, well, the result you will see here. Let's see if we can get it up and running. No. Oh. It worked for a couple of minutes ago, but there is, I have more images. We use the new visualization technology, so this is uh, it's a little too, is it possible to dim the light a little? It's, I think it's the, reflections from the piano, so it's, it's hard to see. In, yeah, okay. Uh, but you can have really realistic images, and well, that's good also to use this for information for the patient, of course, but here you see the fracture. It's not quite nice, the fracture of this vertebra is completely burst, and it's uh, here, but you have also a fracture here. Uh, well, we put this in, uh, huge amount of artifacts from the screws, and that's a problem with conventional CT. Dual energy CT with two X-ray tubes, two detectors, well, then you can get rid of almost all of them. Uh, and blue is a really good color to visualize this. If you use another color, it will, you will see more artifacts. Uh, and here also, you can see it better. It's more realistic. It's called cinematic rendering, this type of, of visualization. And, and it helps you. And for information, also for the patient, it's really, really good. And for the students. So it's, here you can see the screws. Uh, to visualize this, 
well, it's important to visualize, and this is the table. And the table, we invented this when we started to do post-mortem scans. And we couldn't load all the data, thin slices from the post-mortem scans when we make a slice every 0.1 millimeter, huge amount of data. So we got a grant and we developed a table. So this is first the prototype, and it's five years ago, almost six now. Uh, and it's a way that's really, really fast to load it direct from scanner, and it's almost in real time. So you move only the information you see at every moment from the hard drive into the graphic board in the computer. So it's independent of the size of the data you have to start with. And you change data 40 times per second. That feels then as it's completely interactive. And now it's, it's used, I will have it in the Word, Word Expo in China. This is China's health minister that went from Beijing and we have Honorable people, it's the Royal Crown Princess uh, and Prince Daniel. Uh, and Sexha has developed it further here and now for the health market. Uh, and there are 400 centers in the world that use it now for planning. Um, and you can load direct from the trauma city, and it's in almost instantly you have it in the table, and you can rotate and you can do really, really advanced 3D planning before you operate. So it's, it saves a lot of time in OR. Uh, and there are also tools now so you can, you can try to operate, to put all the pieces from the burst fracture. This is a knee fracture. And you can try to put them together. And if you can't succeed, well, ask the computer. And they said, you should take this piece first, and it should be here, and then take this piece. And then you can also have do the templating, you have all the screws, the real screws, the real sizes, and you can say, oh, it's too, it's too small, it's too big, it's too narrow, you can rotate around, and then you go, go to the OR and do the real operation on the same patient, and then you can have this also in the OR. Uh, so it saves a lot of time. In the US, this has been a real success, actually. And all the tables now, sector tables are connected together in a cloud solution. And most of the tables are currently in Peru. Uh, and in China, there are also many. And then you can exchange educational cases, because it takes a lot of effort to do a really good uh, educational case, uh, with all the history, everything. Uh, but here you can do it. And then you can change. With a, you can do an exchange with another hospital. If I get one of you, you will have hours, and then you can do a private cloud solution, or you can buy from other hospitals directly. So it's almost like Apple, an uh, Apple store here. And you can put a 3D scanner, uh, you can have a, a, a 3D printer connected to this also, and big screens. And there is another part of the software now, it's going to the museums and the science centers. So we have many, many tables out there, and we have research ongoing with British Museum, Smithsonian, Chicago Art Museum, mainly regarding mummies, uh, actually. Uh, so we have scanned a lot of them, and this is uh, from, from the Middle, um, uh, Mediterranean Museum in Stockholm. We scanned all the mummies here in Linköping for a couple of years ago, uh, and then from where we scanned them, and this is from the coffin, and you can open it virtually, uh, in the table, and this is the coffin, and we have 3D printed the coffins also, so you can feel them, and, and, and this is was one of the mummies, and we used the same type of, of 3D that you saw before in, in the spinal cord injury, uh, and with the ULN you can figure out what type of food they have been eaten, because you see what type of, of element it is, so to say. Uh, and this has been done together with the uh, Chicago Art Museum. Uh, and this is a uh, mummy from Mediterranean Museum in Stockholm, Scarabies, the older figures. And this figure is a gold falcon. And then we scanned this falcon, and the original falcon is still in the body. But they had 3D printed them in metal, so you can feel it, you can look at it. Uh, and this is, was, uh, is an old calculation machine, math machine, from Christoph Pohlheim. It's a really old, it's a famous scientist in Sweden, and they have a lot of, of his tools, counting machines at the, at the Technical Museum in Stockholm. So you scanned all of them with the same technology that we scanned the patient. And History Channel made a TV episode that's going air now in July in the US. Uh, and we scanned at the same time 
uh, we scanned virtual reality goggles with the same technology that we used on the postmortem uh, exams and the patients. And here you see, we also get rid of the, all, all the streaking metals from uh, artifacts from metal. Uh, and you can get quite nice high res images in our CT scanner directly. And this is in the visualization table, so that we can use. So, this is only an example of what you can do. So, I think we have um, come to an end for me because I'm, the, the 60 minutes are almost gone. It's not only me, we are quite many people at researchers, clinicians, students, etc. at CMIB, and we work together, all of us. So it's, it's not only my personal work that you have seen now. So with that, I would like to thank you for the attention to, to listen to me, and feel free if you have some questions. Uh, now I will stay outside here, also you can ask me. Thank you. Thank you very much, Anders, for um, really providing us with an overview uh, concerning the front line of imaging and visualization. I think that was really great, and it was really an interesting perspective, something that I think is, might be very relevant for many of us in this room um, when you were talking about new ways of visualizing tissue. Mm -hmm. um, in terms of prognostics, in terms of diagnostics, yes. when we come to spinal cord injury, do you think that the uh, methods that you were describing will enable us to tell um, at an earlier point of time, to say at an earlier point of time, if there is surviving tissue uh, in the spinal cord? Yes. Um, can we get a better image, uh, a, more, a better prognostic image concerning um, the vitality um, yes. of the tissue in the spinal cord after a trauma or after uh, an infarction? It's a really good question. I think mm -hmm. that's our goal. Uh, and I think it's, it's, uh, it's not a low-hanging fruit, but I think we will be incremental, we will go there. Mm -hmm. uh, we'll be able to see much more if it's, it's uh, alive, so to say. Mm -hmm. uh, we have scanned for, in the forensic now, we, we looked for different types of way to see uh, and compare with the living. Mm. So we have a difference. And we have seen also, when we worked with uh, the brown fat, we used students a lot. So mm. we, we have activation of the brown fat. We have bought uh, cooling hoods and, and, and jackets from NASA that they normally use for keeping the astronauts warm. We used ice water instead. So we turn it on, and we, in real time, we could see the oxygen consumption in the tissue. Mm -hmm. And, and in the brown fat tissue. And there's not a lot of oxygen consumption normally in, in, in fat, but you can really see it. Mm. And we can see that when you activated the brown fat, um, you can turn it on. Mm. It's the same receptor as it is for chili and, and green tea. If you, if you use chili, you will also activate it and you will be warm. Right. And then you can see the oxygen consumption goes up directly mm. in the tissue. So if you can do that, could possibly be we could possibly use the same type of, of technology and look for oxygen consumption uh, or other th things. Also, multinuclear spectroscopy. Uh, so, yeah, I think we need much more research in this field, but the tools are almost there. Right. Great. Thanks very much. I think we have to move on in yes. order to have time for lunch. Um, you shouldn't eat while being in a haste. And I told you before that I'm not a perfectionist. Fortunately, we do have a perfectionist on our team. Um, and um, I've been told to uh, provide you with some more information, essential information concerning the rest of the day, so that everybody will find their way to everything. Lunch, if anybody should be hungry, will be served in um, the big hall that is called Garden. Uh, on the ground floor, and the crew people, all those with black uh, shirts saying crew on their breasts, um, uh, are going to guide you there so that every f everybody find their way. Um, after, lunch, after lunch, we'll start with uh, the afternoon parallel sessions at uh, 1 o'clock p.m., 13.00, um, and both 
sessions will end at 14.15. One of them was to last until 14.30, but we've had a late cancellation, unfortunately. So 14.15 uh, will be the end of both parallel sessions. Then there will be coffee served in the exhibition area, and you will have an extra 15 minutes for both coffee and for looking uh, at the exhibition and at the posters, which are in Gallery K. Gallery K. Um, after the last session this afternoon, there will be a guided city tour. Um, there will be five professional guides that will show you the closest surroundings, uh, and there will also be some acting, some theater, um, to illustrate the older parts um, of Lynn Shipping City. And uh, the guides are anxious to meet with you all, so please be at the entrance at five o'clock. There will also be a slightly adjusted tour that is optimized for wheelchair uh, users, and our crew will be ready to assist whenever you should need help. Uh, when you come back to the Congress Center in the evening, then there will be a representative uh, from Lean Shopping's commune, who is the head of the Board of Welfare. Uh, and it's actually uh, Lean Shopping Municipality, Lean Shopping's commune, who have sponsored um, the reception, the welcome reception this evening. So enjoy the hospitality of Lean Shopping's commune and um, have a great meeting even this afternoon and have fun as well. Thank you.